So what's gone wrong? A hypothesis. In high school and perhaps even beyond, American science education is the victim of a well-intentioned attempt to teach two different constituencies, each of which might do better in absence of the other. Now, young children are often enthralled by the first scientific materials they encounter. Along the way to adulthood, however, the romance of science frequently fades, withered by years of tedious attempts to solve toy problems in physics or to memorize long lists of chemical formulae. To be sure, professional scientists need the discipline of puzzle solving as well as a firm grasp of intricate details. The lay people of the future don't need that. The many high school students who protest the boredom they feel in science classes will quickly forget the techniques they once more or less painfully acquired. The arcane terminology will vanish. All that will remain is a strong sense of the sciences as difficult, dull, and beyond their capacities. After a relatively short exposure to the disciplined work required even for the first steps of rigorous scientific study, many young people know already that this isn't for them. Why not let them go? Not from science, but from that particular pathway, the route to be traversed by any future professional scientist. Non-scientists need something different. As adult citizens, they should be equipped to assess evidence. They should have an ability to read presentations of new scientific findings, a kind of scientific literacy. Above all, they should keep the curiosity, the sense of wonder they once had before dull exercises drummed it out of them. Preserving that curiosity would give them motivation to keep up with the scientific developments of their times. Fortunately, the past decades have encouraged many talented researchers to write about their fields in lively and accessible ways. Among scientists, popularizer is no longer uttered with a sneer. Once children have learned whether or not they are suited to a scientific career, the task of educating the many who recognize themselves as non-scientists is to prepare avid science appreciators to create readers for all the future books about exciting new developments and their bearing on public issues. Set on one side for the moment the question of how to do that. How does the separation I recommend help with the problem of correcting the perceived weakness of American students' performances in the sciences? Another hypothesis. At the high school and the university levels, science classes are slower and duller than they need to be because teachers must cope with a mixed body of students. Selecting those who take to the discipline of particular sciences allows the class to move faster and to proceed to more interesting and more challenging material. Having grown up in an educational system under which students with an aptitude for mathematics learned calculus at 15 and sometimes mastered the material of most American undergraduate mathematics and physics majors before they attended university, I've always wondered at the awe directed towards those who have studied a little calculus in high school. The malaise inspiring the STEM initiative is a consequence of forcing all American children to study science as if they were destined for a scientific career and of attaching leaden weights to the bodies of those who might otherwise soar. Of course, allowing students to choose one track rather than another, say at age 15, has potential disadvantages. There ought to be opportunities for revisiting decisions previously made. But let's leave the students passionate about science to scamper ahead at their own pace and return to those who don't want to run on that track. Their scientific education, one that should continue through high school years and be further elaborated if they go on to university, aims to preserve their interest in science, to make them scientifically literate, and to instill the critical abilities to understand when advertised new findings are supported by evidence and when they aren't. How is that achieved if they're not required to solve the irritating toy problems or to memorize the long lists? 
Isn't general science education inevitably superficial? You often hear that physics for poets or rocks for jocks courses produce at their best dilettantes. A first answer to that charge would note the well-documented failure of standard science courses to, to yield even that much. Unless there are alternatives capable of doing more than generating mass alienation from science, American education would probably be improved by simply abandoning attempts to broaden those who realize, sometimes during adolescence, that rigorous scientific work isn't for them. Let them spend their time on subjects with more appeal, on music or art or literature or social studies or history. Perhaps at some later stage, a fraction of them, not irreversibly turned off by the drills of the lab or the problem set, might even recapture their early fascination with learning about the natural world. My mention of history offers a first clue about how to do better. History, when well taught, remains popular for a psychologically well-established reason. Human beings like stories. The history of science is rich in good stories. Some of them are thrillers. The source of a cholera epidemic is discovered at the Broad Street pump. Apparently chaotic strata and their index fossils are brought to order by recognizing a new epoch. The Devonian emerges from the great Devonian controversy. These stories need to be rewritten to highlight three major features. First, student readers should come to understand the contours of different perspectives, to grasp the scientific concepts at the core of large debates, and to see how those concepts were developed differently by the participants. Second, they should work through the ways in which evidence was assembled and recognize how a consensus view emerged. They begin to grasp, through immersion in particular examples, the concepts at the heart of the various sciences, and they gain skills in discerning how to weigh evidence across many different fields and contexts. Next, the debates of the past need to connect with the practices of the present. Typically, the episodes studied from history conclude with some ancestor of the framework now accepted. Once that's clearly in view, the students can be asked how to go on. They find themselves in a historical context that resembles the happy explorations of their early school days when they were asked to work together on a practical problem. Now they try to understand how new questions could be generated, new experiments tried, or new evidence sought, what promising lines for scientific research have been opened up by the now resolved controversy. The path on which they decide is then compared with the route taken historically. And as they move from past to present, they're invited to consider and to debate possibilities an actual scientific field may have overlooked. Eventually, they emerge at the current frontier with a grasp not only of the concepts now used in the pertinent field, but with a clear picture of how it relates to a past history of solving problems. This isn't yet enough. Lively presentation and analysis of the development of various parts of science offered in modules to lead students from relatively simple cases to more complex ones or to be supplemented by, probably interspersed with, units aimed at improving reasoning. Appraising evidence requires a capacity for logical thinking. Students need to understand the elements of formal logic and to practice applying them to particular situations. They should learn to diagnose fallacious reasoning and to see how it's sometimes stymied scientific discussion. A basic grasp of probability, as well as some sense of statistical concepts and their use in statistical testing should follow in the later high school grades. Would this supplementary material inevitably bring aridity and alienation? Not necessarily. Skilled teachers have powerful allies in the bookie, the card sharp, and the physician's assistant who calls to tell you the bad news. My own students have never failed to see the point of Bayes' theorem once I confront them with an imaginary medical scenario in which they learn that they've tested positive for a rare and horrible disease. 
Further types of study lighten the presentation of formal canons of reasoning. Gathering and using the evidence is often a matter of learning how to compare and measure things for which there are no previous standards. High school students might again return to the open exploration of the early grades. Entering the classroom, they might find on a table a collection of ape and hominin skulls. They are challenged to devise measurement procedures for ranking the skulls as similar or different. On other occasions, they're confronted with an instrument and asked to use it to answer a question. Or they must devise a new one to complete a particular task. Perhaps all students should experience James Thurber's famous bafflement on trying to see through a microscope and learn to move beyond it. Perhaps all of them should figure out how to weigh something too big to place on a scale or to take the temperature of an object for which standard thermometers are inadequate. Finally, no general science course would be complete without some immersion in the practices of the sciences. Students should learn about the official norms of everyday scientific conduct. They should recognize how and why those norms are sometimes hard to follow and study cases in which researchers have violated them. But the history should be genuinely mixed, juxtaposing the rascals with those who have resisted temptation to cut corners, even with those who have sacrificed their careers to insisting on proper procedures. General education in science ought to prevent acceptance of two myths. The myth of scientists as saints in lab coats and the myth of a research mafia bent on achieving its own nefarious ends. Success in this amalgam of ventures could be measured by the percentage of students able to make the case for anthropogenic climate change. Armed with the desired formal skills and with a conceptual grasp of the greenhouse effect, the 18-year-old ought to be able to reconstruct the logical structure of the reasoning behind the climatological consensus. She should also be able to see the grounds of skeptical doubt. Are the measurements reliable? Have they been properly recorded and analyzed? Can the official graphs be trusted? Have all potential causal factors been considered? She should recognize her own limitations, her inability to work through all the data for herself, but her understanding of the scientific community, like so many communities, an imperfect moral community, should lead her to dismiss conspiracy theories. She should mock the hypothesis of a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese. And now for something completely different, apparently. <laughs> when school budgets are tight, administrators usually decide to cut back on the arts. Classes in music and the visual arts disappear. Instruction in the less important languages, including the dead ones, is abandoned. In the remaining humanities classes, teachers are urged to concentrate on the basics. Less time for literature, more emphasis on functional literacy. Although the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health may be pinched by policymakers apparently bereft of any sense of the value of research, the scorn directed at the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts is far more intense. Those agencies are permanently threatened by the barbarians within the gates. Why is there no analog of the STEM initiative? Why no public wringing of hands about the quality of American education in the arts and humanities? International comparisons are more difficult in these areas and data on relative performance harder to come by. But measures of reading skills show American students performing slightly above the average for affluent countries, occupying a similar level to their position in the science rankings. But the cry for reform is far more muted than in the scientific case. And most people are not worried by the greater ability of students from Europe and from many parts of Asia to speak foreign languages. Why not? Is it economics? Our government properly invests in educating citizens to contribute to national productivity. The sciences provide the keys to future technological innovations capable of preserving American economic strength. The arts and humanities don't. Well, more exactly, to the extent that they do, the United States is already doing very nicely. Hollywood dominates the globe. 
This argument is a cheat and a disappointment. American research laboratories inside and outside our universities lead the way in most scientific fields. STEM stems from our anxiety about whether that lead can be maintained. Why not parallel concerns about Hollywood's future? In fact, the economic frame itself is suspect. The case for reforming science education began with a broader view, seeing the sciences as promoting human progress. Let's take a parallel approach to the arts. Can they also be seen as advancing? At first blush, there's an obvious disanalogy. Science is the parade case for progress. On the other hand, everybody knows that the arts and the humanities don't make progress. We ought to press the point. Is this something that everybody or anybody knows? The sciences make progress by accumulating a set of resources for improving human lives and human societies. The physics of today doesn't lose the brilliant advances Einstein made in 1905. It builds on them. The resources available in 2017 include the earlier accomplishments and much more besides. Today, technology has a broader collection of resources for addressing practical problems, thus yielding the benefits celebrated in the lay view. Accumulation also offers an ever richer picture of nature, advancing human understanding as the official view emphasizes. Analogous points can be made in the case of the arts. Fiction, poetry, drama, painting, sculpture, ceramics, architecture, film, dance, music, are in the main cumulative. We don't lose Sophocles and Shakespeare when we acquire Beckett, Ionesco, Albi, and Pinter. To be sure, there are some losses. The buildings of previous centuries can only rarely be seen as parts of their original environments. Many great performances in dance and theater and music have gone unrecorded. Moreover, as T.S. Eliot recognized, newer developments in the arts affect the reception of older works. After reading the great modernist poets, Yeats, Pound, and Eliot himself, we may be unable to hear Tennyson as the Victorians heard him. Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man changes the resonance of passages in Huckleberry Finn. Nevertheless, the losses are small in comparison with the gains as the body of artistic resources expands. Take a simple test. Would the resources for your aesthetic experience be enhanced if any art form had stopped at some particular point in the past? Now, my parallel depends on claiming artworks as resources capable of making contributions to human lives or human societies. Evidently, any such contributions differ from those identified in the lay view of science. Novels don't cure diseases, and landscape paintings don't advance agriculture. The goods hailed in the official view provide more promising models. Champions of the epistemic value of the sciences are committed to thinking of individual lives as improved through gaining access to particular psychological states. Richard Dawkins offers a characteristically eloquent presentation of the theme when he expresses sympathy for people who have not learned to see the organic world through a Darwinian lens. And the close of Darwin's origin already anticipates Dawkins' reaction. There is grandeur in this view of life. First phrase of the last paragraph of the origin. When the official view is made explicit in this way, an obvious question arises. Are human lives enriched more through the episodes in which people acquire new scientific understanding or by their encounter with works of art? I have no systematic data to support an answer. But after posing this question to a number of audiences made up of undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty, a significant majority take their artistic experiences to be the more important ones. Those who demur are usually professional scientists or scientists in training. If my ramshackle evidence represents the human population, then the official view of scientific progress, the view taken by my physicist friend and by many other 
practicing scientist, entails that the case for progress in the arts is stronger than that for progress in the sciences. But I shall be ecumenical. The arts and the sciences both contribute to our lives. Subjective appraisals of aesthetic experience should be taken seriously. Yet I want to probe what exactly do the arts do for us? Following Dewey, I'm going to distinguish three aspects of aesthetic experience. First is the joy and uplift felt during our encounter with the works of art or the parts of nature that move us most. What prompts those moments varies widely from person to person, and I suspect the psychological reactions with their mixtures of awareness and emotion are also highly diverse. They're united in a single category, aesthetic experience, primarily by a sense of intensity and vitality. On these occasions, we might say, we are most vividly aware, perhaps most vividly alive. Without them, human lives would not necessarily be drab or unpleasant. The high points of aesthetic experience grade imperceptibly into other occasions on which people are amused or absorbed or entertained. Nevertheless, simply in themselves, aesthetic experiences add something rich to human existence, something people are inclined to characterize as more than mere pleasure. Without slighting the subjective value of these episodes, I view two further aspects of aesthetic experience as more significant. Aesthetic experiences are frequently experientially transformative. They leave their impress on future sensory experiences, changing how the world is seen or heard or felt. An autumn walk in the woods becomes pervaded by the cadences of a lyric. The surface of a New York apartment building suddenly shimmers as it's momentarily transformed into the front of Rouen Cathedral. Past aesthetic experience resonates in the present, making the world richer than it would otherwise have been. These sensory transformations are sometimes accompanied by cognitive changes. Works of art have epistemic significance, not because they directly supply evidence for new premises from which we might now reason, rather through their ability to unsettle habitual ways of thinking. Much of human thought begins from judgments acquired from the society in which we live and sustained by the similar opinions of those with whom we interact. Ever since Descartes, epistemology has been inspired or haunted by the thought of some ultimate grounding, the exposure of a foundation on which beliefs could safely rest. That's a myth. Our epistemic lives always start in the middle with a mix of judgments, concepts, and values we inherit with our mother's milk. Scientists, mathematicians, philosophers, as well as all the rest of humanity can only try to improve the mix and to pass on some better version to their successors. The quest for improvement is aided by the experiences that bring us up short. Those might occur in the laboratory, as with Rentgen's fluorescing screen or Fleming's odd-looking Petri dish. Far more common and sometimes equally profound in their impact on human lives are the cognitive changes provoked by works of art. Consider two straightforward examples from 19th century fiction. Whether Abraham Lincoln actually characterized Harriet Beecher Stowe as the little woman who started this big war, there's a point to the story. The immediate reaction, counter novels to defend the institution of slavery, testifies to fears about the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin. So I offer a modest conclusion. Stowe's book prompted at least some people, possibly a considerable number, to scrutinize their racial stereotypes and to take up the cause of abolitionism. Victorian documents provide firmer evidence about the social impact of some of Dickens' novels. Oh dear, I forgot to give you those. Oh, um, as my eldest son tells me, I can't do PowerPoint. <laughs> Bleak House not only offers sympathetic portrait of a young boy, Joe, the slum-dwelling crossing sweeper, it also brilliantly weaves into the narratives the voices of bourgeois complacency, 
those who discuss slum clearance in parliament, those who preach the glories of being a human boy, those who can find nothing to do with Joe but tell him to move on. Dickens rebukes them all in his obituary for Joe. Dead, your majesty. Dead, my lords and gentlemen. Dead, right reverence and wrong reverence of every order. Dead, men and women born with heavenly compassion in your hearts and dying thus around us every day. Many Victorian readers found it hard to avoid hearing their own voices, complacent or uncomprehending in the novel, and were led to wonder about the heavenly compassion expressed in their own attitudes and conduct. Stowe and Dickens modified the ways in which people think and reason in a very specific domain. Often works of art will influence cognition more diffusely. A Renaissance portrait might incline you to look at your contemporaries with different eyes, initiating a process of reflection that culminates in displacing attitudes and concepts you've previously taken for granted. A Beethoven string quartet or a protest song might inspire different meditations on the human condition and on the health of contemporary society. Your imagination moves in new directions, uncoupling some emotional reactions from previously envisaged scenarios and yoking new feelings to judgments you have previously dismissed. In such cases, the artwork produces its changes by way of a more or less systematic reviewing of past experience. Episodes once classified together are differentiated and find new bedfellows. You learn a new perspective, a different language for describing familiar things. Many kinds of subsequent experiences feel the effects of the shift. Although the case for cognitive contributions can be made across many fields and genres of the arts, it's strongest for literature, or more generally for works in which words play a prominent role. Drama, film, opera, fiction, and poetry all have the power to stir the imagination to novel explorations. Sometimes, as with Stowe and Dickens, Wilfred Owen and Bertolt Brecht, Wisława Szymborska and Toni Morrison, the ethical import of a play or poem or novel is almost unmistakable. The work demands of its readers that they wrestle with particular moral questions raised by vivid or puzzling or uncanny situations. Other works, the plays of Sophocles, Shakespeare, and Ibsen, the poetry of Dante and Hölderlin and T.S. Eliot, the fiction of Dostoevsky and Proust and Joyce, raise ethical questions across so wide a compass they can seem less philosophical, precisely because they are less insistent in prodding their audience in a particular direction. Over a lifetime, people constantly return to particular works with new eyes and ears and minds because those works provide so much impetus to perspective-changing ethical thought. Dewey was right to identify the role played by the arts in human ethical progress. As empirical fact, however, the arts, those of converse and the literary arts, which are the enhanced continuations of social converse, have been the means by which goods are brought home to human perception. The writings of moralists have been efficacious in this direction, upon the whole, not in their professed intent as theoretical doctrines, but in as far as they have genially participated in the arts of poetry, fiction, parable, and drama. It's no accident that works many human beings turn to for moral instruction. Scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita and the Bible are either centered on or full of vivid stories. It's one thing to maintain that the arts have a valuable part to play in the system of education. Quite another to claim that it, as it's been conceived, education in the arts fulfills its promise. Both the sciences and the arts accumulate resources for enhancing human lives. The characteristics of the accumulation are quite different. In building on the effects of the efforts of earlier generations, in standing on the shoulders of the dead giants, the sciences typically occlude the achievements of previous decades. No practicing chemist today needs to read Lavoisier's groundbreaking book. 
No astronomer needs to spend time looking through Galileo's telescope. Because later developments always, almost always make studying the original sources irrelevant, except for purposes of fostering scientific literacy, as in my proposed general science curriculum, specialized education in any individual scientific field can economize, discard anything more than a decade or so old. Not so with the arts. Eliot was correct to remind us of how new works can modify perception of their predecessors. Rarely, however, do the favorites of past generations become completely worthless for later audiences. For people passionate about string quartets, Bartok and Schoenberg don't make Haydn and Beethoven irrelevant. Aficionados of musicals return to Jerome Kern, George Gershwin, Cole Porter, and Richard Rogers. Even at the time of Mill's inaugural address, the collection of known works of art challenged educators to select, and their selections have produced versions of a canon whose special status is constantly debated. With the enormous expansion of the collection, with translations of literature from many languages, with appreciation of the visual and the performing arts from a large number of traditions, the task of selecting becomes even more onerous. So many genres, so many cultures, so many historical periods. How should the educational system choose among all the potential riches? <clears throat> and answering that question is difficult because of a mundane fact. Tastes differ. What some people, perhaps especially people like Mill, hail as the most significant artistic accomplishments, leave others, even a large majority of the human population, entirely cold. To take aesthetic experience seriously is to seek a selection of works capable of providing for all of the young access to episodes with the Deweyan virtues, moments of intense vitality, encounters that transform future experience, opportunities for new insights and the development of refined emotions. If you take all the varieties of art to be equally capable of delivering the goods and each person to be individually inclined to a different range of modes and genres and periods, a democratic curriculum in the arts appears as an enormous monster ready to devour all available time. Educators confronted with that vision can perhaps be forgiven for insisting on a privileged canon. They believe, or at least give lip service to the elitist thesis. A relatively small collection of works of art are the pinnacles of artistic achievement. Presenting students with these and these alone provides all of them with access to experience rich in Dewey and virtues. But what about the multitudes turned off by the canonical works? They have to be diagnosed either as the victims of inadequate teaching or as suffering from some defect, insensitivity, indolence, or the like. I think neither diagnosis is compelling. Although many, perhaps most, American adults are uninterested in the arts except as providing entertainment, some of those whom canonical works leave utterly unmoved display great interest in and enthusiasm for art in other modes and genres or from other times and places. Elitists must come to term with the terms with the empirical facts. Alternatives to the orthodox canon sometimes seem capable of delivering the goods when the supposedly privileged works do not. And there appears to be a wide range of alternatives. So some more hypotheses. Many American adults live lives almost completely bereft of aesthetic experiences, episodes rich in the Dewey and virtues. Most of these people would have been able to enjoy such experiences if they'd had a different art education in the arts. But the works presented to them during the course of their years in school, possibly at university, weren't suited to trigger their capacities for aesthetic experience. For each person, there's a range of works capable of generating a life with many significant aesthetic experiences. Call that collection of works the person's favorites. There are massive differences among the favorites of the American population. Differences in types of art, styles, genres, cultures, and periods. So a moderate egalitarianism. Most people have the potential for rich aesthetic experience. Many are badly served by current education in the arts. 
Across the population, lots of different works would realize the potential. Different folks need different strokes. The collection of all the works belonging to someone's favorites, the union of all the sets of favorites, is expected to be very large indeed. Not a conjecture to contain every work of art ever produced, not by a long shot. Moderate egalitarianism parallels my earlier critique of education in the sciences. Just as many students are turned off science for life by the curriculum through which they suffer, so too for the arts. Hence arises a need for reform. Not only should art remain in the curriculum, but the work students encounter ought to be far more varied. Recognizing the great diversity among favorites raises again the specter of the art monster poised to consume a vast number of school hours. Improving science education turns out to be the easy case. So what can be done? The first and most important task is to establish a bridgehead. During the very early school years, introduce children to a variety of arts. Look first for works that excite. Offer a diverse set of options. Observe the individual reactions. So as my first lecture proposed, the classroom must contain a large number of adults, teachers, aides, parents, volunteers, all with their own aesthetic passions. Children should explore alternative types of art, both as potential creators and as appreciators. Art forms, genres, and styles that leave them indifferent are temporarily removed from the choices offered to them. The adults who mentor them try to guide them to a small but diverse collection of arts, perhaps one type of literature, one species of performing art, one genre of visual art that they find particularly fascinating. Next, encourage them to explore their chosen art forms further. Have them no longer to attend art class with their age peers. Put them amongst others who share their interests. The goal is to develop the skills required for creation and the understanding needed for appreciation. Permit children to strike their individual balance between creation and appreciation. Encourage them to spend time on the techniques and styles they find most appealing, but also to pursue aspects of the chosen form they initially find difficult or off-putting. Keep detailed records and use them to suggest directions of further development. Particularly when a child's original enthusiasm wanes, early propensities might offer clues about how to find an appropriate modification or even a substitute. Once a bridgehead has been established, once a child has found a small cluster of art she finds rewarding, education enters a new phase. Some time, uh, assign some time to broadening from the bridgehead. Children return to art forms, genres, and styles they originally rejected, reappraising them in light of the skills and tastes they have since developed. Mentors guide them in discerning similarities between works they admire and others they find dull or difficult or alien or baffling. Teachers and aides who are passionate about the unattractive works point out how those works have qualities not possessed by the favorites. With a combination of individual attention, critical skill, and quite probably a bit of luck, the child's artistic compass expands. New styles and genres are taken up in the fashion already exemplified in the further development phase where they go in with the, lots of people who share the same interests. So it continues through the school years. And after as well. Adults too need opportunities to develop their tastes, to learn about styles of art they haven't previously explored, even to develop creative skills in fields new to them. School education ought to be embedded in a milieu containing cultural centers, spaces for further training, and for exhibiting and sharing works of art. Those centers, freely available to all, would embody opportunities for mutual learning. Aesthetic exchange would become part of deep democracy. Would it work? Nobody can know in advance. As before, I offer suggestions for educational experiments. The program just outlined could be developed in many alternative ways, but it would start with the well-documented interest young children show in different kinds of art. 
integrating creative activities with occasions for appreciation, including explorations of the natural environment, can not only build technical skills, learning to draw the contours of everyday objects or to sing simple melodies in tune, but also indicate where a child's interests might lie. As Dewey famously advised, art should be part of everyday experience. Aesthetic sense is developed as young students learn to arrange the objects in a small space, to design part of a flower bed, or to choose recorded music to accompany a short dramatic performance. With luck, the developed sense carries over into later life and into the ways adults set up, maintain, and modify their environments. As with the sciences, the most critical achievement would be preserving the curiosity and joy that typically accompany young children's artistic activities. So long as the time spent in dance or song or carving or play acting or photography continues to be deeply satisfying, art can occupy a large part of the curriculum without shortchanging other educational domains. If it's fun, simply expand the school day. In closing, it seems right to face a crushingly obvious objection. My overall program, the one I've outlined for you in these lectures, demands a massive infusion of resources. Asking that in, for that investment, a critic will say, is simply absurd. I agree with the premise. Serious education would be expensive. I reject the conclusion. Here's why. Back to Mill's inaugural address with which I started. Mill went on so long because he recognized a deep problem. In a complex society, even basic training has to be lengthy. Our education system has evolved haphazardly, responding at crucial junctures to blindingly obvious misfits between what's been inherited and the current needs of society. We could go on tinkering. STEM represents a form of tinkering. Or we could try to probe more deeply, to make progress more intelligently, as Dewey would say. What should an education for the 21st century accomplish? So in the last uh, week, a couple of weeks, I've been reading Du Bois on education. And he makes exactly the same point in an address he gave at Fisk in the early 20th century. He says, you know, education used to be so simple. It's still simple for people he visited in Africa. I said, we can't do that here in America, but how do we think about it? How do we think about it so it works as seamlessly and beautifully as it does in the case of people who live in much simpler environments? Now, I've answered this question by sounding a number of themes. Education is about preparing people to work, but it's about more than that. And in considering how to train the workers, it's a good idea to begin by thinking about a work environment suited to healthy societies and flourishing individual lives. Second, if we hope for graduates who'll be prepared to participate in and contribute to democracy, we'd better be clear on what democracy is and what it requires. Third, if we want education to equip our children for fulfilling lives, it would be good to understand the potential contributions of different kinds of knowledge cognitive skills, and of aesthetic sensibility as well. Education is a lifelong process. Consequently, a well-designed educational system should provide adults with the chance to grow in new directions. A precondition of continued growth is the preservation of curiosity, something all too easily deadened and destroyed. Lady Bracknell's famous verdict on ignorance applies equally to curiosity. It is a delicate plant. Crush it and the bloom is gone. American education today is all too efficient at the crushing. Rousseau taught us how to do better. Students need individual attention. The expense emphasized by my imagined critic doesn't primarily result from investing in new buildings or more electronic equipment, although these are surely needed, especially in the dilapidated environments in which some of our children are currently uh, forced uh, to spend a lot of their time. The bulk of it comes from training and paying many people, paying them properly too, to undertake a deeply rewarding service job. Our teachers need the prestige and the pay of their Finnish counterparts. 
I don't know how many of you know this, but in Finland, if you're the valedictorian of your high school class and you want to go to edu onto education school, you may not get accepted. The competition is so fierce. We should have vastly more of these teachers. That will indeed cost a lot. But would the investment be absurd? I try to meet the challenge with a question. What else do you think is worth spending money on? Does anything rank in importance with developing children to live fulfilling lives in a healthy democracy? In my beginning is my end. The main enterprise of the world for splendor, for extent, is the upbuilding of a man. Thank you very much. Now you get to run around with your microphone. Uh, thank you for uh, your talk today and for your presentations this week and for your um, graciousness and visiting classrooms and meeting with members of our campus community. Um, I, I, I don't know the state of the technology of the recording of today's uh, lecture, uh, but there is another technology in play, uh, the printing press. Uh, these talks will appear uh, as a volume published by Oxford University Press. Uh, <clears throat> in the meantime, uh, uh, you will have another chance to uh, have comments, questions, and so forth. But I'm going to assert my privilege to start off with one. Um, the importance of the sciences, yes. The importance of the arts, yes. Um, what about the humanities? I'm so glad you asked that. But first, I'm going, to, I'm going to quibble with something you said before that. So these talks will appear as a volume with Oxford University Press. No. Something which has these talks at its core might, well, will appear. There will be a volume, and I hope that these, the talks as I've presented them to you will be at the core of it. But preparing them, and talking with people here about things I've said has led me to see the enormous amount I need to discover and to uh, elaborate in a future book. Um, this cannot be, um, as I originally thought it might be, a slim volume. Uh, it's going to have to be, it's going to have to have much more guts and substance than I've given it so far. I mean, I've crammed a lot of material into these three lectures, and I apologize if you feel you've, you know, you've, you've been forced to drink from a fire hose. Um, but there's so much more. I mean, Mill was right when he said education is among the most inexhaustible of all topics. Um, OK, so now the answer. So where do the humanities fall in this? I so wanted to say this, but I couldn't. I mean, you didn't give me four lectures. Um, so, and I also don't know completely how to, how to answer the question. But in general, I think of the humanities as liaison offices. This is Dewey's term for philosophy, and I think it's true for the humanities. In their different ways, the humanities open up for us ways of making sense of ourselves and our lives. That's why they're called the humanities, of course. But think of, they do it differently. Think about art history, art criticism, music history, music criticism, literary criticism. These open up individual works of literature. They connect works of of, of, sorry, works of art or literature. They connect those together. Sometimes they go across genres in ways that, that give more than the individual works could give alone. They, they unfold. I mean, when I listen to art historians presenting lectures or music historians, uh, I, fi I find myself listening in new ways. And so the works of art themselves become richer. So there's a sense, I think, in which the, uh, the, the art critic, the music critic, the literary critic are people who are able to amplify and enrich what individual works of art are able to do. Um, I think that theory in these domains is important. It is important to reflect on, on the ways in which this kind of work can best be done. 
But what is absolutely crucial is the practice. And I get worried sometimes about literature departments and art departments and music departments that devote most of their attention to, th to discussing theory and not doing the practice, which is so absolutely essential and crucial to this vital front function. Okay, what does history do? What do the cultural parts of anthropology and ethnography do? They give us ways of appreciating life that we hadn't previously seen. So I love to think about works of history like Robert Hughes's The Fatal Shore, wonderful book which is about what it was like to be in Australia under the system when you arrived as a convict, usually um, sent across uh, the ocean for some absolutely trivial offense, and you then um, you're then thrust into this awful system, the, the, the penal system in Australia. I think of works like Carlo Ginzburg's The Cheese and the Worms or Le Roi Ladurie's um, wonderful book Montaillou, which give you a sense of what it is like to be at, a, to live, be at a particular place at a particular time. There are wonderful ethnographies. Um, uh, oh, there's a fabulous ethnography of which has inspired me uh, by a woman named Jean Briggs called Never in Anger about the Inuit. And uh, these, these enrich our understanding of the possibilities for ourselves and what it is to be human. And what does philosophy do? Well, philosophy for me is not an analytic dis discipline. It is a discipline informed by its history that it endeavors to synthesize, to bring together a vision of of as many things as it can connect. And in the modern world, it's, that's often very difficult because there are so many things that stand in need of connection. But uh, connecting bits of politics with, um, with, with bits of, uh, of, of our current technical situation, connecting economic life with political life, connecting the sciences with, um, with features of social life, connecting the arts with our lives. These are tremendously important and legitimate activities for the philosophy. And so I'm inclined to say that one of the messages for the humanities is a famous uh, closing sentence, two word sentence from E.M. Forster's great novel, Howard's End, only connect. That's one of the things that the, that, that the humanities do in, I, and it's so important that they do. And so, Everything I've said about the arts should translate uh, in, in amplified form to a defense of the humanities. But I wouldn't know how to give that fourth lecture. That's just sort of, that's a, uh, that's a pricey. Thank you, Phil. This has been inspiring. I look forward to continuing to engage your scholarship and your practice. <clears throat> As um, somebody who's founded three duly inspired intergenerational yep. schools, who works as a scientist in art organizations. I also appreciate your perspective on progress in the arts. I think it really asks us, as many people have, what do we mean by progress and yeah. how does that relate to human flourishing? Here's my question in the only connect response. Okay. You've, you've, you've developed a, par a parallel system for science and art. Yep. If you look at the pedagogy, pedagogical approaches are actually somewhat similar. So if we go back before the child knows the difference between science and art, or goes back ethnographically to, to places where these distinctions aren't made. Don't you think there's something in the aesthetics of science and art, we talked about this yesterday, patterns or something, that you actually could make both those channels more powerful by not separating them, only connect? That's very interesting. a very interesting thought. It is, of course, a very Deweyan thought to think that the sciences, the, uh, the, the sciences and the arts really belong together. Yeah, um, I mean, in certain senses, at the very early stages, what, what this is all about is sort of um, practical explorations in, in, in the classroom. Now, I'm going to say one thing about, the, about this, this myth that the arts don't make progress. What this rests on is the following very obvious thought. You know, most people think that the greatest plays in the English language weren't written in the present century, but were written some time ago, possibly um, in the 16th and early 17th centuries, right? And so you say, well, it just shows, doesn't it? Drama doesn't make progress. So consider the following question. 
did physics make progress between 1905 and, say, 2017? Well, look at what happened in 1905. Einstein wrote four groundbreaking papers, one on the photoelectric effect, one on black body radiation, the E equals MC squared paper, and the special theory of relativity paper. Nothing produced in that 2017 ranks with that. Einstein all by himself wins. So if that's your criterion, the, the, uh, the drama produced in, say, 2017 isn't as good as that produced in 1604, particularly good year, I may say, um, then, um, then you, you know, that, that's no skin on the nose of artistic progress. As I said, we don't lose Shakespeare and Sophocles when we acquire uh, the dra dramatists of the present day any more than we lose uh, what Einstein did uh, when, we, when lesser advances are made later on. So following up on Peter's comment about the similarities of yeah. the arts and the sciences, as a practicing scientist, I think he's been fairly successful and I've collaborated with uh, a lot of engineers. I've always felt that as a basic scientist, I'm closer to the arts than I am to my engineering colleagues who are trying to build things. Yeah. And, and the, uh, the, the point is that when you're doing basic science, the thing that really floats your boat is when, is when you, you do an experiment and it reveals something that is aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. It's just a beautiful thing to see how some neurons that are burning of an insect control a certain yeah. Yeah. behavior. The difference is that we also have funding, and we have to we have to staff our, our our labs and things. So then we turn that around and we sell it to the funding agencies, telling them, "Oh, this is going to be really important for society and everything." Else. Because NSF tells us we have to we have to do yeah. a, a broader impact statement. But if you get truth serum to the really good scientists, they would tell you that they if they had no funding, they would do this anyway. Yeah. Because Absolutely. It's simply beautiful to find these yeah. new concepts. And it is really the same thing as what my colleagues in the humanities and arts are doing. I don't think there's any difference between them. We should be looking for the common. Okay, so I so many, many people would uh, would echo what you've just said. So you're very much on board with my with my theoretical physicist friend. Do you like him? You think that the, the, the really important stuff is the is the understanding and and as you say, the aesthetic side of that. So, um, yeah, Watson and Crick said about the double helix when they found it, it was too beautiful not to be true. <laughs> uh, and, and, and <laughs> so um, one of the most famous episodes in the history of mathematics is the acceptance of complex numbers, square roots of minus one, at the moment that the connection between the exponential functions and, and the trigonometric functions becomes apparent. And there is Euler's beautiful identity, e to the i pi equals minus one. What a fantastic equation, right? You take this mysterious number e, the base of natural logarithms, you exponentiate it with the square root of minus one and pi, both mysterious numbers. And what do you get? Good old minus one, something that's relatively straightforward, although not completely straightforward since there was resistance to negative numbers for a long time. Yes, these kinds, there are these kinds of patterns, as Peter puts it, and as connect, and connections, which, are, which do seem to have aesthetic significance. I mean, I think physicists would say that the standard model has a certain kind of aesthetic um, uh, going for it in, in quantum mechanics. So uh, you're completely right. Um, and that, that's, I think, also part of, uh, I mean, the, the Darwin line I quoted, there is grandeur in this view of life. Um, there's this kind of aesthetic sense, which Dawkins takes up. Um, I think he overplays it, but <laughs> yeah. Hello, and thank you for this wonderful lecture. We do have appreciation uh, in general, arts, humanities, you can only put some music on and every little kid is going to start to move around or give them some crayons and they're going to like to draw, not to mention the adults. And 
uh, we are confronted with everyday progress in science and technology around us. Again, everybody likes to text and use their all their apps and all their gadgets. Not me. However, the educational uh, curriculum boils down to political will from local to national. Um, so, can you go a little bit more specific and um, tell us your thoughts about what can be done practically um, so we don't wait for political will to, yeah. uh, to, to, to have mercy on, on, on all of us, science included, um, science, humanities, and arts. Uh, outside of the waiting for the political will to change the system, the educational system. Okay, thank you for that question because uh, um, this is the sort of question that's been has come up several times and and I've really been I've been thinking about this while I've been here um, and so here's a way it might work suppose I could get um, a very nice sugar daddy let's call him Bill Gates to invest some money in setting up a number of schools it might be a disaster it might just fall flat completely. This might, I mean, you know, as I say, these are proposals for experiments. I don't know that they'll work. Um, uh, but suppose they did, right? Suppose they actually did work. And people saw that the new kind of, cur the new kind of approach was um, training children or bringing out children who were happy or well-adjusted, ready to contribute to a democratic society and had passions and interests that they were trying to fulfill. Well, that might start a movement to have more schools like that. So the thought, is, the thought is that just if you can, if you can start, if you can get this going, maybe it could snowball. And if it snowballs, then eventually um, one would hope that uh, the government would put in the needed resources to make this available on a national scale. Now, one thing that I really worry about in um, it, with this picture is I think that there are, and I said this in the first lecture, and I haven't said it since, there are real serious deficiencies in the ways in which some children in our society have any opportunity for education at all. So I will actually, I've, and this is one of the areas in which I feel I must supplement. I must try to find a way of, of developing some of the proposals I've made so that they can be adapted precisely to those places where they seem most needed in the, in, in the, the, the neglected school districts. I mean, if you've read anything about the variation in American schools, um, you know that some children go to go to schools that that you know are awash sometimes in polluting chemicals, and um, and many go to schools that are dangerous. Um, my eldest son taught for a while in a in a New York high school for which none of the equipment worked, none of it whatsoever. Um, you know, this was um, he was trying to teach biology and chemistry um, to 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 children to you know, fairly advanced children in, in school, and nothing. No, he, I mean, he, he couldn't use any visual um, uh, sort of materials at all. Uh, so, I mean, obviously there has to be, I think there has to be a tension in what I'm doing to those kinds of needs as well. We have time for one more question. Mine's really more of a comment. I'm in the art history department here, and I was struck by your uh, comments about the primacy of the written word, because one of the only ways I've found to get students to admit to their own biases about the canon is for them to read Washington Irving's The um, Immutability of Literature from the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon and Lawrence Levine's book Highbrow, Lowbrow, The Emergence of a Cultural Hierarchy. And so um, this was wonderful tonight. It really sort of changed the way I'm going to think. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, this, is, this, may be, this may be a, um, a sort of... Um, um, a logophobes uh, a, or a logophile's uh, pers perspective on this. It just seems to me that that, it, that for the, it, with respect to the cognitive stuff, it's easier to. I think it's actually easier for us to uh, 
be changed by visual works of art and pieces of music if there are literary works that can somehow prepare the way for us. Um, and and I, that's something about which I need to reflect more. I mean, I am, a, as you might suspect, somebody who's, uh, who's very much um, moved by literature in particular. And so I think perhaps, like Dewey, I tend to overestimate the, the primacy. But this is, the, the, these are things that, that I think need to be explored. But thank you. Well, Philip, I want to thank you again, and we will all look forward to uh, uh, whatever it is that emerges. Uh, uh, no, 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 don't write me a blank check. <laughs> in, in particular, we'll look forward to the Lost Fort Lecture. Uh,